Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. So I'm sorry. I, uh, for whatever reason, database people uh, wake up really early. Uh, a Python conference, for example, wouldn't even start before 11. And as a freelancer, I wake up sometime after 2 because I don't get this morning romance, rom like, ooh, it's a new day, so you know, it's a bit difficult for me uh, to, to be here at 11, but all right, I'm joking. So hi again, um, I'm Linus. Uh, uh, I'm a software developer at Academia. I work for one of the un American universities. Uh, they have this media research uh, project uh, called Media Cloud, where they Basically, we are trying to download all the news articles in the world and store them on a couple of computers and do then the actual researchers do shiny things with them. So, and we use Postgres as our backend uh, database for storing basically everything. So, uh, there are two specific things about academia. One is that uh, given that the project is small and uh, well, the funding is limited, there are no specific, specific roles in, uh, in our project. So I'm part-time software developer, part-time DBA, and part-time HR even. And, uh, and also, uh, Coming to the subject of this talk, uh, researchers, for whatever reason, are really reluctant to delete data. Like uh, basically, a version of Postgres for academia would wouldn't have a command delete because there would be no need for it. They are always like, "Don't delete this. Don't 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 get rid of this. Maybe we will use this for future research to investigate something." Right. So as a consequence of that. Uh, our um, data sets grow big, and as a part-time DBA, I was forced to deal with uh, huge tables. Uh, by, by huge, I mean uh, about 100 gigabytes and more. And uh, the difficulty about huge, huge tables over 100 gigs is that it's rather hard to, to find out uh, how do you deal with them, because uh, you could go to uh, an official documentation page, which is amazing. Uh, it has, Postgres has the best docs, probably after PHP. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to uh, do's and don'ts and know how about how to, uh, how to go with production situations, I find it somewhat lacking because, well, in their defense, it's, it always depends on your particular circumstances. So, uh, before the presentation, I would like to thank this gentleman uh, who has been a great help. Uh, apparently, his name is Andrew, but I'm not sure because it's the internet. He might as well be a dog, or as they say. Uh, so he, he has been really helpful about, uh, about various tips and tricks on how to deal with uh, huge data sets. So anyway, so in, in this presentation, I'm going to... Uh, uh, propose a couple of ideas that we have found out through Andrew or trial and error or tr through intensive Googling about, uh, about how to, uh, in regards to certain tricks that you can do with, um, uh, with huge tables. So, so to start off with, the typical advice is uh, that if you have a huge table, you have to partition it, right? So, but uh, I believe there are bad reasons and good reasons to, to do it. Uh, bad reasons, the, the first one that I, I have um, uh, noticed people think when they read about partitioning, when they uh, consider an option to partition the tables is that they assume, thanks to the docs, that uh, partitioning as such will make their uh, operations, their queries faster, which is not always the case because by partitioning, no matter whether it's the old style in inheritance-based partitioning or the new style uh, uh, 
uh, range declar declarative partitioning uh, is still as a bunch of it tends to add a bunch of triggers use and then the query planner has to consider more tables upon uh, encountering every query so it might not always be the case that your um, that your queries become faster uh, also uh, uh, also, I, I have encountered people going for partitioning at smaller data set sizes, for example, uh, on Reddit and elsewhere, people consider partitioning like a five gigabytes worth of a table. So uh, I have, well, nothing against them. If you have five gigs, five gigs you have five, five, gigs, five gigabytes, you know, you uh, sleep well at night, but uh, I I think like uh, a good start, good starting point for for when you need to consider partitioning uh, is like I don't know 100 gigs. Per, uh, if your table grows to uh, 100 gigabytes, then you should definitely think into it. But then it gets subtle because depending on your usage usage pattern and and various. Uh, uh, depending on your usage, usage pat pattern and various options about your table, it might be more or less than that. <coughs> so uh, to add a little something to the first point, uh, before going into partitioning, you should absolutely, totally uh, benchmark, benchmark that with as realistic data as you can get. So if you have time to spare, I would even recommend uh, trying it out with a data set of, uh, with the sample data set of your production table. Uh, just like set up a staging environment somewhere because the uh, thing is that things that you have tried out and they seem to be work for five gigs won't necessarily work the same for 100 gigs. Well, obviously, but you know, sometimes it's a bit hard to forget because typically, typically things just work in Postgres, uh, but in this case, it's, uh, you got to definitely, definitely try it out. Excuse me. <coughs> So now to the good reasons to, to partition tables. So the first one is uh, if you happen to have a bit more than two billion rows, then you will you are getting into like a, this shady gray area, which is called XID wraparound. And then all of a sudden you find yourself Googling about uh, why did your database crashed. So, uh, of course, auto vacuum helps with that, but but typically you just don't want to get your table to more than two billion rows as such. Also, if you have a single big monolithic table, uh, you will probably encounter that auto vacuum runs constantly on it because Postgres figures out that that like. Uh, the rows get inserted and deleted from this table all the time, right? So it basically never stops. And uh, uh, with, and this is how you will encounter some soft logs, but still you wouldn't be able to always do DDL, DDL changes and such. Also partitioning, you will just uh, as per the manual, you will find partitioning very beneficial if your data that you are storing in this table, if it fits, if, uh, if it uh, falls into this old data and new data pattern. For example, if you insert some rows uh, in 2016 and forget about them pretty much forever, you just have to keep them here and uh, for the most part, you're working for, with the most recent rows, then uh, partitioning will probably be uh, great for you because then the query planner will figure it out, figure out that uh, you just need the new rows and then it could skip, skip the whole bunch of partitions that it doesn't need. And in my, my personal experience, uh, well, I'm sorry for profanity, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So partitioning seems like a th way to go, uh, but you have to, um, by, by testing it out with, uh, with something similar to your production environment, you have to figure it out whether, uh, whether the main maintenance required on a partition setup uh, will, be, will be less than the maintenance uh, re currently required by your current monolithic uh, table because uh, partitioning doesn't come free because there are many subtleties about it and unfortunately many of them you cannot Google out uh, because uh, Silicon Valley startups have like five gig tables so you know uh, it's not on Stack Overflow. And, and this is, if you go that way, this is the path that you yourself is going to take uh, com together with uh, Rhodium Toad, the Andrew guy, so hopefully. <coughs> so uh, again, to, re to return to, the, to that point of mine, uh, don't partition too early, so don't start partitioning when you are uh, at five gigs of data, unless you are absolutely, completely sure that this five gigs will grow to 100 gigs in, in a couple of weeks or months. Or too late. Um, some, sometimes people rationalize, and I can totally understand them, that uh, well, this, this table has grown to 200 gigs, but it's like kind of working, so, so maybe we, we should skip all the, all the crazy partitioning for, for later because it takes uh, developer time and then it might take some downtime as well. So, uh, so this procrastination will just um, make things harder for you in the future when you will uh, have to figure it figure it out in a rush, for example, when your table grows to uh, 2 billion rows. Hardest thing to answer is, uh, well, the partition key is, is one of the primary and most important things, uh, questions to answer, but the second hardest thing is the optimal partition size. So uh, there is no magic bullet here, unfortunately. Uh, and it all depends on how wide is your data, how wide is a typical row, and well, typical row. Uh, how wide are your rows, and uh, how much RAM do you have, and whether or not you would like to, uh, you would like certain indexes to fit into that RAM or not, and also the access patterns, meaning that uh, uh, whether or not you are you access all data or new data or uh, whether you uh, uh, whether you uh, whether a typical condition in your query includes the partition key or it doesn't inc include that and then the query planner has to go through all of your partitions so the magic bullet uh, then the nearest bullet to the magic bullet uh, that was told to to me, that Andrew told me about was that you should target at around 100 million rows per partition or, and or 100 uh, gigs, which, all, which unfortunately, again, it depends on, on your, on your uh, data. And uh, one caveat that unfortunately I have found out about uh, after, uh, after running everything in production is that uh, don't create too many partitions. So as Stefan said, there are going to be changes and improvements in Postgres 12 on, on, on how uh, queries get run against partitions. But at the current time, uh, uh, documentation says that it's around 100 partitions, which is the maximum for the number of partition that's, partitions that you could have. Uh, in my experience, it's more like 20. And and, uh, and if you have 20 partitions, and then your query planner has to consider, <coughs> bless you, <laughs> and then your query planner has to consider there are all 20 partitions, then it's going to be slow. But uh, it's going to be slow in this terrible manner is that your planning itself is going to be terribly slow, 
and this and where does the planning time go uh, this is something that you cannot uh, figure it out by running explain or explain analyze so <coughs> so let's wait for postgres uh, 12 So I'm gonna. I'm planning to tell you about. Uh, I'm planning to tell you a couple of tricks of of mine that we have uh, used for partitioning. Uh, this is the sample table that we that I'm going to use in my um, examples, uh, which is just a basic table. Uh, just it has a primary key, first name, last name, and a motto, uh, and then. As it so happens, you are, it's called friends, and as it so happens, you are super friendly, and let's pretend that you have like a billion of friends or something. So uh, we insert a bunch of sample data to this table, so just a bunch of random text. Uh, so first trick is what they call a ha half hash index. So probably people who went to actual computer science school have a better name for it. Uh, so correct me if, if, if I'm using the term incorrectly. But um, so let, let's assume that you have a huge table of friends and you are just look, doing a very simple lookup for, for uh, you, you want to find out which friends has a motto of of this particular uh, string. So um, you would probably start off with a simple B tree index, uh, which would, in this, with a million rows in my uh, experiments, it would take up 65 megs, uh, we, which is the recommended in index type for most of the things because it just works. Uh, and is the, because and also it's the most flexible one because you uh, you could do um, less and more comparisons and various other things. But uh, if your table is like really huge, this 65 max will grow to uh, 65 gigabytes or something like that. So. Uh, you might be looking into other options provided that it's only a simple query that you are running. So the natural choice, of course, would be the hash index, but um, so which is slightly smaller, also more limited in that you cannot do uh, less or more comparisons. But unfortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately, one could call it deprecated because. Uh, the hash index operations don't get written to write ahead log, and also in some cases it doesn't get rep replicated. That was, that was fixed. That, that was fixed? Oh, I didn't catch up with that. Yeah, so. yeah. hash indexes are now low log, they didn't get replicated. All right. It was fixed in 10? Yeah, I think it was 10. Not necessarily, they're not saying they're necessarily a good idea to use. That's a different subject. All right. But they are low log. I think in still in Postgres 11's docs, and there is a note that uh, that they are still not uh, while logged. So, uh, yeah, but maybe maybe the docs didn't catch up. So I'm not like I'm 60 percent sure that this is the case. So is that the documentation? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So you can use hash index, but in some cases it might be a, a bit of a huge index for you. Uh, so the trick that I'm uh, going to uh, propose is is using half hash index, which which you can use uh, to uh, find candidate rows and. Uh, which won't be super accurate, but then you can just do like a double check afterwards. So this is a index predicate, predicate, 
uh, which basically does uh, imitates the hash index in that it takes a string parameter at the point number one, uh, calculates a MD5 hash of it, then splits it in half to reduce space used by the hash, and then uh, to conserve space, uh, it converts it to a big int. So all in all, it takes up only uh, the, your ha your index entry takes up only uh, eight bytes by uh, by an inch for an entry. So to use that index, assuming that you have only this and one index, you would um, you would query it using the uh, half MD MD5 helper to uh, give and well. There are documented collisions in MD5 making it unsafe, and to add to that, you are like stripping half of it, right? So there is uh, there is no guarantee that that the rows that um, uh, that are going to be found would be would match your condition. So you have to um, double check it. So with this nasty trick, you can get your index by half. Uh, in in my case, uh, down to 21 megabytes. So th this is like a rare case where you would be using something like this, but but still you can just consider it. <coughs> so, excuse me. Second trick out of uh, three is our way we do partitioning. So again, this is the schema of the table and uh, typical know-how on how to uh, partition an existing huge table is that you create a partition setup uh, and then you add the non-partition table as one of the children tables uh, to this partition setup as if as if it was uh, a partition by itself. So making it a one huge partition, and then you restart production, and, and then gradually you just move um, all the rows where, where they belong. So I'm going to propose a slightly different approach in that we are going to have both the non-partition table, the partition table, and we are, we are going to use uh, updatable view which would just be in front of them and serve it it will pretend that it's a table so you can both select from it and update it and delete it and so on so again this is the schema and for for now we just have a non-partitioned friends table oh, uh, to, to add to that uh, it's gonna it's gonna have uh, the upcoming slides are gonna have like a lot of uh, crazy SQL, so so uh, don't like write it down or, or anything. So just uh, just I want to communicate the ge the general idea, and you I'm I'm sure it will uh, you will be able to work it out on on yourselves later, or you can look up those slides. So. <coughs> So first of all, we just rename the non-partition table to something else, right? In our case, it's just simply friends non-partitioned. Uh, and we create a, a partitions uh, base table that, that we are going to use for, for storing new rows. And eventually, we are going to move the old rows from the old table to this, to this uh, new setup. And just we create a bunch of helpers, for example, uh, a function that's going to uh, return our partition size, uh, in which case we are going to store uh, up to 100 millions of friends in, uh, uh, in a typical partition. So we create yet another helper, which is uh, it just uh, given that we use friends ID as a as a partition key, we just need to figure out uh, which partition does uh, 
does, uh, does a particular row go to. So uh, just a note, this, this presentation is using um, uh, the old style inheritance based partitioning. So uh, in case you are using the declarative partitioning, in, in some cases you might not need all of this uh, scaffolding. So it's just a simple uh, helper function which returns a partition uh, partition name uh, for for every partition key. So uh, one again, one of the requirements of the inheritance-based uh, partitioning is that you have to have an insert trigger on the partition table for the insert trigger for the insert trigger to figure it out uh, which um, which which tables should the new row go to. And we just create a simple little helper to find out whether a particular table exists. And this is a function that uh, simply, simply put, it creates uh, all the partitions for the for the existing rows, for example, if you have like a, if 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 we are keeping a hundred million rows per table and we have three hundred million rows, it would just create and execute DDL DDL statements for uh, for three million rows. So it would create like uh, three partitions plus an additional partition for the uh, for the rows once they reach four. Hundred million. <coughs> so upon running this helper, we now uh, end up with this setup. We still have this non-partition table, the old table, and we have a new table which is currently empty. But now it, it so happens that it has a bunch of, of empty uh, child tables to which the uh, rows are going to go to. So, and this is the point uh, of the whole presentation of mine. Thank you for waking up. So, make a photo of you and all. Uh, so, that's the trick. Uh, we still have the non-partition table and the partition table, the old one and the new one. And we just create a view which unions all, uh, both, both tables in, into, into one so that we, if we were to select from it, which we obviously going to do in production, uh, then, the, then the view will, will query both table setups and figure it out which, uh, which, uh, which particular table uh, has, this, have, has this specific row. Uh, uh, you have to update the serial sequence on, on this table. Also, uh, views as such are not updatable, right? It's, it's just a view. Uh, so, but we want to use it as if it was a table. So we, uh, as it turns out, uh, you can uh, attach a trigger to a view, uh, which is uh, on insert or update or delete trigger, and then the trigger will be fired off once you attempt to do right operations on, on a view, and then the trigger could decide, uh, oh, could decide w what to do. So using this uh, trigger, you would make your view into what's called an updatable view, and as such you could achieve um, achieve the situation that you can uh, just insert, update, or uh, delete from a view as if it was like an actual table while, while you are moving the rows from the old table to the new table. So basically this trigger uh, on inserts, it moves, uh, it, it, 
writes the new rows to only to the partition table because this is where it's going to end up eventually anyway, right? So we can just write it here, write it there. Uh, on updates, uh, it, it goes for both tables because we don't know which, uh, which table is the row is on. And it's the same on deletes because uh, it's, it's, it tries to delete from uh, both tables. So finally, we we add this um, we add this trigger to a view, and suddenly now we we have a table, and all of this uh, that I have shown before could be run in a migration. There are some uh, nasty logs there, so you might need for to plan for some downtime, but it's like totally uh, not, not much. So. <clears throat> so after you, have, you restart everything, you now have an old table and a new table, and you have to eventually move the rows uh, to the partition setup, because that was your idea from the start, right? So uh, one of the tricks uh, that we, given that you have a huge, massive uh, table to begin with, it is likely that auto vacuum is going to run perpetually in it and, well, never stops. So if you run this um, in a, uh, in a, in a script, right, then your, uh, your helper, which moves a chunk of our rows from the uh, old table to the new table might get just locked be just lock, locked out uh, because it's uh, because it would be waiting for the auto vacuum to complete so you have uh, what what I do is that I just uh, kill off auto vacuums on the old table before before I copy over a, ch a chunk of data. <coughs> so a simple copy operation. First of all, we delete a bunch of rows from uh, from an old table. We return them and then we insert them in a new table. Uh, the trick here is that uh, the naive implementations which I have started with. Uh, was that I would just um, copy a bunch of rows uh, without any ki any kind of a condition because well uh, there is a certain different difference in in what order do you copy the rows in in terms of performance but I thought it wasn't like um, it didn't matter in my case so I just did something like select rows from all table uh, limit something, right? Uh, but also I have tried a variant with order by, but uh, it turns out that while you uh, will be able to uh, copy a bunch of rows from the start of the table uh, that way, uh, eventually you will hit a terrible table bloat because uh, because uh, then after some time, once uh, you make a bunch of rows at the start of your table dead, uh, uh, then the, you will end up in a situation where Postgres spends a, a lot of time uh, looking for live rows to copy uh, because it has to go through all, the, all of the dead rows. So the trick that seemed to be working for me is that I just um, I just copy chunks uh, using an indexed uh, an indexed ID. So in which case uh, Postgres uh, is is uh, way faster. Uh, but well, the unfortunate thing is that I have to keep uh, tr keep track of the. Uh, in, of the index ID that I that of the chunk that I have last copied 
to the partition table. <coughs> so uh, that's about it. So af after uh, struggling with this for like, uh, it depends on your table size. Uh, it usually takes weeks or months. To copy over ch um, your rows to the new table, chunk by chunk. Uh, so after a while, you just uh, just do some additional cleanup. Like uh, you might get might get rid of the updatable view. Uh, you you would just truncate and uh, delete the old table. Given that it's, it's it's basically empty, it wouldn't use less space because it's a bunch of dead rows, right? Uh, but you just no longer need it. And this is how you would end up with your, all of your rows in a partition table. So the last trick, am I out of time or, or probably? <coughs> the last trick, uh, so if you, have a, uh, if you are running Postgres, you have a bunch of options for, for backup. Uh, you, you can, go, if you have a simple small database, you could just go for uh, PG dump and just uh, dump your um, table somewhere and then just store them somewhere. And well, it takes a while uh, to restore it because it has to recreate all the indexes and such. But it's a viable option if if your data set is small. If you grow to um, to hundreds of gigs, uh, then you have to look into other options like uh, PG Backrest or PG Base Backup or PG Barman, which uh, have their own advantages and disadvantages into which I'm not going to get into today. Uh, just I would like to note a certain uh, certain underdog in, in how could you do a backup. So basically, you can just create a volume snapshot and copy it somewhere. My favorite thing uh, for, for, uh, for that is ZFS. Oh, no. Oh, here it is. We are back. <laughs> uh, so you could do this with uh, Linux volume snapshots. Uh, as well, but uh, I found them a bit hard to um, to configure. And uh, using ZFS, you could uh, you can uh, also implement incremental snapshots, which which are very uh, speedy and work nice. Um, so I just I'm kind of a fan of ZFS. I think it's like. A, a, overlooked technology just as IPv6 uh, version 6, which is we are going to be using IP version 6 for what, like 15 years now. So, <clears throat> so the basic idea is that uh, you would start off with the initial snapshot. Let's call it backup one. And then uh, ZFS uh, supports sending those snapshots uh, just piping those snapshots to somewhere else. So you could use, you can just uh, ZFS send your snapshot to some uh, other, other server, which happens to also have a ZFS partition. And you would end up with this, uh, with basically a ready to go uh, Postgres data partition somewhere else. And to do an incremental backup, you then just create uh, another snapshot, right? And just like, just like that, you send it uh, as well. Uh, in, in our case, in, in my example, I'm using SSH to, to pipe that to a remote server. And as it turns out, ZFS is smart enough to, uh, to, send, uh, to send only the binary diff over the line. So it doesn't send the whole snapshot, the whole snapshot, uh, only the differences between the uh, two snapshots, which makes incremental backups uh, really, really fast. And restore, restoring from that, uh, given that you have your write ahead log on the same partition, which might not always be the case, but if it is, uh, restoring is super fast as well, because this is just a 
a point in time snapshot of, of your uh, database's life. Uh, so if, if your, uh, if your disk database uh, crashes and you would like to do a fast start, uh, fast recovery, you can just go to your backup server and then just go ahead and start uh, running Postgres uh, from, the, from the backup partition without any kind of a, uh, additional steps needed. So uh, again, this, this approach might not always, might not be applicable in all of the cases, but uh, you might find some use for it. So that, that would be it. Uh, I guess, um, well, I'm trying my best, but I still don't know much about this whole partitioning stuff and, and running Postgres uh, at scale. So if you have some more insights, feel free to approach me at any point. I'm, uh, I'm trying to be friendly as well. So, and if you have any feedback on, the, uh, on this presentation, please don't hesitate to email me or something. So thank you. <coughs>